Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. On this week's program, one lawmaker makes the case for using bonding dollars to build mental health treatment facilities, and two others weigh in on taxpayer-funded recruiting efforts for skilled trade workers. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capital Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. Recently, the Senate Republican Caucus announced a series of proposals aimed at improving Minnesotans' access to mental health treatment and services. Senator David Senjum, chair of the Capital Investments Committee, is author of two bills that would use bonding dollars to improve mental health throughout the state. He now joins me in the studio. Thanks for being here. Well, good to be here, Shannon. At first glance, using the bonding bill to pay for mental health treatment and services and buildings sure. for those things seems like an unusual strategy. How did you come up with this idea? Well, uh, what we've uh, found out, I think, uh, certainly where I live in Rochester, but, but across the state, is that uh, we need places for, for these people. We need, like, structures, buildings, and so on and so forth. I happen to be chair of the Capital Investment Committee, and so it, 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 it virtually, I think, fell into my lap in terms of uh, something to think about and something to pursue. Uh, uh, our committee can build things, and uh, this will uh, uh, tend to, to build things, what we call crisis centers, across the state of Minnesota uh, for people that uh, are in crisis and need some help. So two of the bills, let's start with the first one. The first one would use $30 million in bonding money to build six 24-7 crisis centers throughout the state. So can you tell me more about these centers? These are for acute cases, and kind of what's the model? What are you thinking here? Yeah, uh, so it's what do you do at 3 o'clock in the morning? Uh, mother, father, uh, son, daughter, whatever it might be, friend, relative, uh, is in crisis, uh, where do you go? Typically, it's the emergency room. Uh, or you perhaps call the police department because you're, you just don't know what else to do, and uh, they may, in fact, even take this individual to jail, uh, which, uh, which happens, unfortunately. Uh, but even emergency rooms really aren't properly equipped for these kind of things. And so the crisis center is, uh, uh, is the place you go at 3 o'clock in the morning to get that 24-7, 365 uh, immediate help to deal with this crisis. May even involve staying overnight for a couple of nights just to get stabilized. But uh, that's the kind of thing that we don't have right now, which we need desperately across Minnesota. So these would be six regional ones. How would locations be chosen and, and all of yeah. that? We say six. Uh, each each uh, site uh, would, would uh, if they apply, uh, receive up to $5 million. Okay. So it could be okay. more than that if, uh, if a site was le less than that. But uh, they would be determined uh, through a nomination process. So, and individual counties or local units of government will nominate themselves to the Department of Human Services. They'll look at the criteria, the proposal, and they'll make some judgments as to where at least initially the sites will go. So they won't necessarily all be the same. It would be, you know, the size that they serve is probably based on the population and, and it, who exactly. would be served. And it, it could be a storefront in one community. It could be a building in another community, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It'll take, there'll be different models, I'm sure. It's one thing to build it. It's another thing to staff it for the ongoing costs. Where do you yeah. expect that money to come from, Health and Human well, Services? Well, I wondered about that initially as well. I went to uh, my county and then subsequently different counties, and they said, you know what, we are spending so much money on mental health right now by shipping, needing to ship people away and, and pay for their residence uh, that we can, if we bring them back home, so to speak, we can pay for this. As, for instance, Olmstead County pays $1,865 a day uh, to house a certain individual right now in, in, a, in the Anoka treatment uh, facility. Uh, and so you, you start accumulating that money. Of course, there's uh, Medicaid, there's insurance in some cases, but at least the counties have suggested to me that uh, they're going to be able to pay for this based on insurance and uh, what they otherwise uh, have to pay to ship people off. So the money's there, you just need places for right. them so they can stay local instead of exactly. having to go off. And exactly. that same county official uh, that you just mentioned at the press conference, he talked about two cases. One was his brother, and it wasn't even Anoka County. Right. Those people had to go to other states in order yeah. to receive treatment. So why is Minnesota deficient in this area? Well, I think it, it, back in the 70s and 80s, uh, uh, psychotic drugs came along, and I, there was, I think, a tendency to close down all of, I think it was 11 state hospitals across Minnesota, close them down and, and depend on drugs and outpatient treatment. And, and certainly, to some extent, that's worked. Uh, but uh, what we forgot to do in, in all of that is uh, leave anywhere left to take these individual patients as they 
as the needs arise, even on an immediate basis. We're going to depend on emergency rooms. Emergency rooms aren't equipped with this. Uh, police departments aren't equipped with it. Ambulance uh, departments aren't equipped with it. And, and so what we have now is, 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 is really rather poor in terms of, of a response. Uh, these crisis centers and later on uh, uh, what we call uh, regional uh, support center is, uh, are, are, are going to help. And that, and that you mentioned yeah. that how we used to institutionalize this, and those have closed. Right. The models have yeah. changed over the years. Your other bill, your other proposal, would spend fifty million dollars in bonding yeah. for up to three behavioral health centers, and this is intended for longer-term treatment. So, who, who would benefit from these types of services? Uh, individuals that, uh, that that do have mental illness that that need maybe not intensive treatment, but but need to be watched, making sure they're on their medications. And, uh, and just kind of washed and monitored over a period of time until they, they can get back into their home or whatever it might be. It, it's certainly a choice thing, but, but there's a lot of individuals out there, frankly, we see them on the streets, uh, that uh, have uh, mental health problems and, and, and need somewhere to go where they can be monitored and, and measured in terms of their, their treatment and their recovery. And, and same question for this one. Where would these up to three be located, and how would they be funded? It's it's the same. It's the same process. Same it's a nomination process. These are housing infrastructure bonds. Uh, we have a couple of these already in, across Minnesota. We have one in Winona that we visited during our bonding trip. Uh, these uh, these 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 serve rather well in terms of what they're doing. It's it's new. It's innovative, but we need these desperately. You've been very open about your mother's struggles with mm -hmm. mental health. I have family members who've yeah. struggled with mental health and who continue to struggle. Your bills offer a beginning right. for the state to handle yeah. this. Um, what more needs to be done, do you think? Oh, I think uh, we certainly need to grow mental health uh, professionals, if you will, uh, through training through our college and university system. We need to pay more attention to that. We need more of these facilities. I mean, I'm proposing a start. But that is certainly not the, the, the end. Uh, these will begin to address the problem. Uh, I would believe in subsequent years there will be a subsequent bonding proposal to offer more of these kind of sites across Minnesota. Senator Senjum, I want to thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you so much, Shannon. The Capital Investment Committee heard testimony from celebrity chef Andrew Zimmern in support of an $18 million appropriation for Second Harvest Heartland. 540,000 Minnesotans at a minimum are estimated to be food insecure, lacking consistent access to food to lead a healthy life. I know many of you here know about Second Harvest Heartland and the role it serves as the hub of Minnesota's emergency food system. The food that Second Harvest Heartland distributes to its network of food shelves and food banks reaches communities in every single corner of the state. It's not just the big cities, it's not just Hennepin County, and it's proportional to the need in every single county across the entire state of Minnesota. We all know the statistics. Hunger impacts one in 10 Minnesotans, one in six Minnesota children do not have enough food to eat. That is not a shameful statistic, in my estimation, that is a criminal statistic. Hungry children in a state that has the food to feed them, we just don't have the funnel big enough until we fund Second Harvest Heartland to be able to get the food into the tables and plates of those that need it the most. These are real people who can't reach their full potential because they lack something we all take for granted every single day. Comment to uh, Mr. Zimran, uh, we met a couple of years ago. Um, I don't know if I'd use the comment, you are what you eat based on your TV show, so I'd be very <laughs> careful about that. One, <laughs> Mr. Zimmerman. <laughs> Senator, if I may, one man's weird is another man's wonderful, my friend. <laughs> but you don't like walnuts, Mr. Zimmerman. Do, I don't understand that. I have a big that. surprise for you in the upcoming season. I actually have found a walnut that I like. Okay, thank you, sir. <laughs> And Governor Dayton congratulated the University of Minnesota Duluth Bulldogs men's hockey team on their NCAA Division I championship with a proclamation. Well, this is a very, very exciting morning for, for me and for, for Minnesota. You know, the UMD Bulldogs won their first national championship my first year as governor, and now they've won their second my last year as governor. Both happened to be at Excel Arena. In the middle of the second period of the of first game, I screamed so loud that one of my dogs jumped up and started licking me in the face. So I had to, I had to restrain myself a little bit more. But I was, uh, like all of uh, us, rooting all the way, and it was just, just phenomenal to think the 
beat Ohio State and Notre Dame, the two largest, uh, best funded athletic operations, uh, collegiate athletic operations in the country. Ohio State and Notre Dame, just, just phenomenal. Such a proud moment for our state to have the championship hosted here in St. Paul, in Minnesota. So proud of our fans. We definitely want to thank all of the fans that were in attendance. That was absolutely a home ice advantage and something that lifted our great student athletes and staff uh, to accomplish such an achievement. Wonderful for our campus, for our university, uh, and always for the state of hockey. It doesn't get old, I can tell you that. But no, it was certainly a, a very interesting year for our team. I think... Uh, you know, to, to end up being national champions was certainly unexpected by a lot of people, but uh, we had certainly a big turnover and a lot of young players coming in, but I really, really enjoyed watching that group grow. And Senator Rich Draheim is author of a bill that would give $1 million to Project Build Minnesota, an organization whose mission is to promote careers in the construction industry. To talk more about it, Senator Draheim joins me in the studio. Thanks Welcome. for having me. Yeah. Uh, so a testifier bef uh, on this bill before committee said that kids today don't know about these jobs and that a change in perception is necessary to ensure that these jobs have workers into the future. But is this an appropriate use of taxpayer dollars? You know, I, I think the goal for society is to get people engaged in the communities and, and be a productive member of society. And I think we have funneled all the kids down one track and, and not everybody's meant to go to college or, or to be on a, a career path um, that requires college. And there's a lot of young people out there that like to use their hands and, and they're very handy. Um, we've eliminated that is an option in, in most of the schools, and I think we just need to have it front and center that there are more options than just going to college right after school. Well, and so this, you bring up the, the idea of industrial arts education, which was called SHOP back, mm -hmm. back in my day. Schools have, have kind of done away with these programs. Do these programs need to come back? And in addition to this kind of appropriation that you're talking about, what if we had SHOP class back in high school? You know, I, I think we wouldn't be in this position today if we had shop class still, or what we called shop when we went. Um, I, I think it plays, shop class would play well with the robotics programs that a lot of schools are having, especially in the metro. Um, I, I think they go together very nicely. And, um, you know, I think the whole goal of this is to give people an option to do uh, honorable trade. You know, any job to me is honorable if you are happy doing it and you can provide for your family. And I have a lot of friends that have been very successful working in the trades, um, very comfortable lifestyle, um, love their job, they love um, what they do. You know, they get to see a project from start to finish. Uh, they make good wages. You know, the, the number that I've been given is 61,000 average pay um, so you can go through a four-year college and have, I think the average that's thirty-eight, thirty-nine thousand dollars for for a undergraduate student, or you can take a different path, which isn't for everybody. This isn't the magic um, trade mm -hmm. or magic uh, job that's going to solve all our problems. But I, but I do think it has to be one of the pieces of the puzzle for kids going to school. You know, some might choose the military, some might choose college. Some might choose a trade, and a lot of these trades have training um, built in um, to their programs, depending on what employer you go with. Uh, some have apprenticeships. Right. right. So, and some of these are union shops. So sometimes, you know, if you want to be, say, an electrician, you could go to a union shop. Sometimes right. you're, you're not. Yeah. How do unions fit in? Will Project Build promote both union jobs and non-union jobs? Right, right now, from my understanding, the way it's set up is that they're um, are people that are, are pretty much donating money to, to this um, campaign to educate our young people about the option of, of going into the trades. And if the unions want to be participate in that, I, I know they asked a couple of them and they were turned down, but that is an option. I, I don't think um, this is a, a, a pro-union or a pro-merit shop discussion. It's about getting kids interested.
And, and, and if they go to a website um, to get interested in a, in a trade or a different profession, I think that's wonderful. And, and if we have that discussion in with the counselors in, that, in the schools, because the, the people I've talked to in, in the trades, both union and non-union, when they talk to superintendents and counselors, that's not really something they focus on or talk about, is the different options you can have after college and or after high school, you know, and, right. and they push mainly a four-year institution. Some people aren't ready for college. Well, some people have no interest in college, and, and it is true over the last couple decades there has been this push, like everyone needs a college education. There's been this idea that some of these high-tech jobs will require that extra level of education, mm -hmm. But we're talking about different kinds of jobs here. And, uh, and, and very, I mean, some of these professions are, are very technical. Um, you, you have to be very bright to, to do these um, type of jobs well. And, and like any profession, you have different levels. And um, you, know, you can make a good living. I saw uh, on the website it listed them out by tiers. There yeah. were different tiers of, of skilled labor yeah. and then presumably different levels of pay. Mm -hmm. Do these jobs generally provide um, good benefit packages and health care? A, a lot of them do. Not all, just like any profession. Um, you know, I, I think when, when you look at where our demographics are as a state, and, and one of the reasons I decided to run was because I feel that my kids are going to face a huge challenge. I have a nine and a 13 year old. So in the next five to 10 years, we're gonna face a huge number of people retiring. And I'm sure you've, you've had programs yes. that talk yes, about that. Yes, the workforce shortage that Correct. everybody's afraid of actually. Exactly. So, and, and then if you look at the demographics of these tradespeople and, and the age of them, they had shop class back in their day, mm -hmm. like we did. Yes. Um, but you know, as they age, we're gonna have less and less people um, filling in their shoes uh, on the track we're on. And, and, and that's true for, for nurses, it, it's true for tradesmen, and, and, and a whole bunch of different fields. So I think as a society, we have to have that discussion. And, and we're not forcing anybody to do it. But I, but I think we need to give it a little nudge and, and to get that front and center in the schools. Well, school is, I mean, because we're talking about the youth, so it seems to me that schools, school counselors, um, should be at the forefront of this. I know in other countries, at a much younger age than we, well, we really don't ever say, you know, you, I think you'd be good at the trades, or I think you sh would be After a great lawyer. Yes. We don't do that in this country. No. Is that something maybe we should consider? I took some, you know, when I was in college early on, some aptitude tests mm -hmm. that kind of, I don't remember what they were. But, um, <laughs> Lawmaker. Yeah, uh, probably not. But, um, you know, it, it did, there are available, and I think there's some online even that someone can take, but, um, you know, to me, life's a journey, and, and we take a lot of different stops on that journey, and um, I think there are a lot of people that would be happy in the trades. I know there's a huge need for people in the trades, and I think you could provide for your family and enjoy what you're doing. Um, we, there was a bill in the past you know, you had brought up unions before mm -hmm. versus non-union. Right, right. um, back in 2016, there was a few million dollars to help promote the the union trades. And, you know, to me, the the problem is at the high school level. And, and, I, and I'm not blaming anybody, but right. I think there needs to be but, better communication between right. industry in general. In your and mind, this is a good way maybe to start that conversation correct. and get that going. Exactly. Senator Draham, we have to stop, but thank okay. you so much for your thank time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Governor Dayton announced his appointment of former Speaker of the House Paul Thiessen to the Minnesota Supreme Court. He combines a brilliant legal mind, the highest integrity, and a special understanding of Minnesota from his 16 years of service in the Minnesota House of Representatives and his extensive travels throughout our state. On behalf of my fellow justices, I want to welcome Paul Thiessen to the Minnesota Supreme Court. The fact that Paul was selected among such an impressive array of candidates speaks volumes about his experience, his legal knowledge, and his temperament. Paul, we look forward to working with you 
as our court wrestles with the most important legal issues facing Minnesotans. I am really excited and inspired uh, by this opportunity to serve as an Associate Justice of the Minnesota Supreme Court. Uh, above all, because it really is an amazing opportunity to uh, serve the state that I love so much and care so deeply about. And my experience in the legislature has given me a deep, deep uh, respect for the work of each of the independent and co-equal branches of government, government and uh, of the court's distinct role in the dynamics of our government. Uh, I am now ready to move from policy making to principled interpretation of the law. According to its website, Project Build Minnesota is a movement, a vision, and a vehicle to motivate our youth to learn more about the many benefits of pursuing a career in the building industry. A bill requesting a $1 million appropriation from the legislature recently came before the Senate Jobs Committee. Senator Jason Isaacson joins me to offer his perspective on the measure. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Wonderful to be here. The state is facing a workforce shortage, and testifiers at the hearing spoke in particular about a shortage of workers in the construction industry. Is allocating state resources to educational efforts aimed at showing young people all of these opportunities a good strategy, just generally? I think as a, as a second or third dairy part of a strategy, it's not a bad idea. Uh, the reality, though, is, is that we need to spend more money on actually educating people in vocational trades. That's what we need to do to solve this problem. We have a historic disinvestment in education and over the last 20 years we've been pushing college four-year degrees is the only way to go at the expense of our trades uh, expense of our vocational career and technical educational classes and that has absolutely caused one of the problems we have today which is a shortage of people that can work in skilled labored positions well and you're an educator so you've mm -hmm. been watching this for a while why have we defunded vocational education at the high school level well I think there's a couple of reasons one you know there just was a real cultural push for four-year degrees and that people really value that and I think that's a uh, an artifact of a really educated populace here in Minnesota the problem with that is is that when we don't provide a balance when we say that one is inherently better than the other uh, people are going to shy away from the other one and, and we need to have a post-secondary option that goes from philosophy to precision welding and values all of them for what they bring to the table right but what do parents want? They want their kids to be doctors and lawyers you know not a lot of kids parents are saying you need to go be a plumber right and so how do we find a way to in the school at least, give people an accurate or a realistic display of how much money you're spending, the degree you get, the kind of jobs you might do versus how much money you're spending in a trades, the degree you get and the kind of jobs you might do and how much you'll make at each of those jobs. I don't know that we're accurately giving that information out, which would seem like it's a good idea to make sure we do that, but all you're really doing if we just do that is Band-Aid. You're not solving the real problem, which is we don't have an infrastructure that anymore creates people that are skilled labor like we used to in our high schools. You've already said this, but the message has been for the last several years to the youth, college, college, college. You need mm -hmm. a college education. If you don't have one, you won't make as much money. Mm -hmm. So the messaging has been everyone needs to go to college. So are educators somewhat to blame for this shift that's happened, this push towards college and this, you know, disinterest, diseducation in trades, skilled, skilled work? You know, I, I wouldn't say the educators because the educators are on the front lines in the classrooms. What I think is you have a, a shift probably legislatively in our government approach to what's important and also uh, within the family and then also administratively in the schools. Uh, when you see us pushing more towards a lot of these testing assessments and a lot of class time that's being taken up to meet certain requirements, uh, sometimes arbitrary requirements, uh, and a lot of the testing we have to do is just squeeze those out of there because they weren't a part of the rubric of what measured success for a high school student, right? And so we need to enter that back into the being part of the rubric. So to say it's educators as much as it is the entire system just took a, just took a turn towards one thing and really at the expense of the other. In my high school, I took home ed, learned how to sew, sew. I, took, I learned how to bake. I also learned wood shop. We built a, 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 a house every summer in the football field. There was carpentry classes, metal shop, computer graphics. All those options were there. And it's hard to find that kind of array of options in a high school setting today. And <clears throat> until we learn to bring that back and get people interested in things beyond just a four-year degree, we're going to have a bunch of people that are taken care of and a bunch of people that are left behind. The idea behind Project Build <coughs> is to use money for a, for a statewide awareness campaign to educate mm -hmm. youth and their families about the viability of a career in construction. 
Is it problematic for state funds to be directed toward a private industry in this way? Yeah, and let me tell you why. Because this is my bill from four years ago. I offered this bill when I was a freshman in the House. Uh, I looked at the exact same idea, went down the exact same path, and what I realized was even if I bring everybody back to the idea of vocational education, our high schools are not at all equipped to do that. And so that's when I began to understand this is really a problem. It's a problem for two reasons. One is the historic reason of how our state is forced and wanted and asked labor to train them, fund their own training programs and doesn't take private dollars or public dollars for private training. And now you're turning around and if you look at their website, it's private firms that would benefit from the work that they're doing. And they are not engaging labor in that way. So what it does is it gives an advantage to one group that just doesn't want to invest its own money. And so they talk about how there's a worker shortage. That's a half truth in some ways because if you look at who they're able to find to work, they're having problems filling their jobs. Whereas the unions don't have any problems filling with their employees, they have people they could put to work. And so then what's the real difference? Is it a lack of skills or a lack of wages? And that's the real, that's a crucial question. The second reason why it, it, the, the bill doesn't work, and so not just the historical factor of the way we've dealt with unions in the past, the second reason is because <clears throat> when you don't have the infrastructure in place to provide what you need, uh, this, all this does is, is a band-aid. It just gets people to become more aware of possible positions, but they're in no way more capable or able to take on those positions than what we have right now. It's not that people aren't going to apply for it. The problem is, is, do they have the skills to actually get the job done? And the second part of it is, are we paying them what they're worth? And there's a real wage difference between uh, jobs that work with unions and jobs that don't. And that's a fundamental difference that you're never going to hear the, the non-union side talk about. They always say it's because they can't find qualified workers. Well, the unions say the qualified workers are here, you're just not willing to pay them. Well, Project Build's website says the average salary for a construction worker is $61,000 a mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. uh, so students going into going to college, going into debt, I mean, that's a really attractive alternative. It is. It so is. this would this is important information to people. I for agree people with you. And, and my idea was to create a central hub like they talked about where we would have a, a, a place where the Department of Labor can reach in, businesses can reach in, education can reach in, uh, actual labor unions can reach in and they can have a like a like a clearing us almost like a social network for just jobs and careers and so like when my cousins graduated from high school from Underwood Minnesota and they want to go on to be plastic molders or precision welders and they see there's a program linked to a job in Central Lakes or down in uh, southwest Minnesota they can then go to that and pursue that the, that lack of awareness is there there's no doubt about that and and it, and as long as we're not funding public dollars into private businesses then I, I don't think that's a problem, but that's exactly what their bill does, right? And that's where, that's where it crosses the line for me. And the second part of it is, is that, you know, it's a million dollars and it's kind of window dressing and people feel good like they did something, but they really didn't because we haven't solved the problem of getting away from career technical education on a K through 12 level. We absolutely positively need to fix that side of it if we want to have a workforce that's engaged, and we don't. Senator Isaacson, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.